It's the Real News Network. I'm Sharmini Pires coming to you from Baltimore. Less than five months after being elected president of France, Emmanuel Macron has already plummeted in popularity polls. He has plunged 22 points since the first IFOP poll published three months ago when he enjoyed a rating of 62 percent just after his May 7th election win. Some polls have him as low as 40 percent in popularity. Is this due to his domestic policy or his vision for Europe? The young president won the election against Eurosceptics on the right and the left and promotes an agenda of strengthening the European Union. President Macron spoke last week about his vision for post-Brexit Europe. L let's have a listen. Europe, too, is an idea carried by optimists, visionaries, an idea which we need to reappropriate. Um, for ourselves again and again, because the most beautiful ideas, those that drive us forward and improve the human fate, are always fragile. And Europe will only live through the idea of it that we have. It is up to us to make it stronger, more um, meaningful, and not. Uh, be obsessed with the given format that history has g given it, because the format will change, but the idea remains. To discuss Macron and his views is Laura Raim. She's a freelance journalist based in Paris. She writes for radical publications, among them Le Monde Diplomatique. She is the co-author of the book, Casse le Euro pour Save le Europe. Thanks for joining us, Laura. Thanks for having me. Laura, let's start with why the popularity of President Macron is in the decline. And is it related to his policies towards Europe or is it domestic policy? I'd say it's primarily for his domestic policies. Um, Macron campaigned saying he was neither left nor right. He was very vague with his promises. He was just talking about enthusiasm and being modern and uh, being progressive. And he was never very clear on his very pro-market policies. And now it's appearing very clearly that his agenda is a traditionally right-wing pro-business agenda. Now, it appears that there is a lot of labor unrest and there's been a lot of protests against uh, Macron's policies, particularly towards uh, workers. Uh, give us a sense of what that unrest has been about and how this has contributed to his decline in popularity. Well, the first thing people are very angry about is the anti-democratic nature of uh, the way he's doing things. Um, Macron has said that uh, to CNN that democracy is not in the streets, uh, when in fact his own uh, legitimacy as a president is very weak. Um, the, the final drafts of the, the labor law were passed without any debate in parliament, since the government has uh, introduced them by executive order. Uh, and the, um, the, it should, we should also be reminded that the president himself was elected by only 43% of registered voters. And of those voters, only 43% voted for his program. Uh, and the main reason they voted for him was as a default, as a, a barrier against the risk of a uh, Marine Le Pen uh, fascist far-right government. So his own legitimacy is, uh, from the beginning, very weak. So, Laura, what's in the decree that people on the streets are protesting against? And what is the policies of the Macron government in terms of pursuing this decree? The idea behind these um, reforms is to say that France needs to dismantle its worker protections uh, to make France more competitive and to make it more flexible in order to tackle unemployment. Um, this is completely untrue. All the terms of the, the sentence are untrue. Uh, Piketty recently has showed that uh, uh, the level of productivity of the German and French uh, economies is almost identical if uh, as measure, measured in terms of GDP per hour worked. Um, France does not need to be more flexible. It's very easy to fire uh, employees today. P companies do it all the time. And most of all, uh, the OECD studies recognize that there is absolutely no correlation between um, a more, flex more flexible labor laws and less unemployment. Uh, we know for a fact that, um, you know, 
uh, French, our French uh, social model uh, is not incompatible with low unemployment levels, uh, you know, because uh, before 2008, before the 2008 financial crisis, France had less than 7% unemployment and it had exactly the same supposedly rigid, you know, labor laws or it had the same social system, the same social, you know, the same amount of social spending. Uh, so it has nothing to do with unemployment. And so it's appearing very clearly to everybody that unemployment is just an excuse to um, move forward and, and, and simply give more power to companies to impose whatever um, helps them make a bigger profit and uh, to strip workers of rights that enable them to have a say on uh, their working hours or working conditions and to have a basically you know, decent working hours. Laura, rolling back on labor rights isn't the only reason that Macron is falling in the polls. What else are his policies that are making him so unpopular? Well, you could also also mention his regressive tax proposals that are a huge provocation. Uh, he's basically uh, proposing 4 million tax cuts, 4 million euro tax cuts for the wealthiest 10 percent, whilst at the same time scrapping housing aid to all students, taking away 5 euro, 5 euro per student. It's it's symbolic, but it's important, and people are very angry by this. Another symbol is we, in France we have um, a special wealth tax called the ISF, and he's reforming that too, and he's excluding yachts and private jets from this wealth tax. He's excluding also anything, uh, the share um, company shares. So basically now you can speculate and that will not no longer be taxed. The only thing he's keeping in this uh, ISF tax is um, uh, housing property. So these are, um, these are extremely regressive uh, tax proposals. And the fact is people are more and more angry and what's interesting to see is that uh, at the beginning uh, we, the only unions who were calling for protests and calling for strikes were the usual ones were with the CGT and um, Solidaire and now even the most moderate unions Force Ouvrière and CGC which is the, the unions of managers even they are calling now for strikes and protests not only against the labor reforms but for all the other um, right-wing policies that he wants to implement. Right. Laura, the global media coverage of France creates the impression that France is besieged by terrorist attacks day after day. There has been terrorist attacks in France, and of course this is a serious concern, but very little coverage exists when it comes to France's social problems, uh, its military adventures overseas, and, and so forth. But uh, the erosion of civil liberties in the country, is this leading to his uh, uh, fall in the polling? Unfortunately, I don't think so. It should, but I have the feeling that people are not as mobilized on this question as they should be. This is not uh, unfortunately, this is not something that people are very sensitive to, even though, uh, you know, he's just passed into law an anti-terrorism bill, which is basically just transferring all the emergency measures that, he'd, that, that we've been using, the police has been using for the last two years. He's transferring this into permanent law with this anti-terrorism bill. But the truth is, there is unfortunately not much mobilization going on against this. Laura, let's turn to Macron's uh, view and vision for Europe, as stated in his uh, speech we rolled in at the beginning of this interview. What are his plans? Well, he's always campaigned on a very pro-European platform. This was actually the way he wanted to be identified as a candidate, neither left nor right, but European. This is a way to sort of try to reconfigure the political landscape between no longer the left and the right, but the pro-European, progressive, enlightened, um, neoliberal uh, political offer against the uh, archaic, closed, nationalist, racist um, Le Pen. That, that's the way he tried to reconfigure the political landscape. So this is really part of his uh, political identity, to be very pro-European. But then when you look uh, at his various speeches that he's been making, you know, recently, it's always so vague and empty. He talks about the idea of Europe in the in the 
extract you, you just uh, showed, you can hear words like the idea, optimism, uh, strong, meaningful, but you know, we never know exactly how he's going to address the real problems that have been plaguing Europe for the last 30 years. The fact, I mean, he says nothing about, I mean, he says the words democracy, sovereignty all the time. He says the right words. But he says nothing about how to actually address the problems that have been plaguing Europe for the last 30 years. Nothing about the fact that Europe is profoundly anti-democratic, the fact that all the decisions are being made by non-elected bodies, the, Europe, you know, the, the Central Bank, the European Commission. Um, the fact that the single currency is, has always been completely flawed, has never managed to set uh, the institutions or the common budget. He doesn't address the fact that uh, the Eurozone is a dysfunctional single currency union that has never established the rules, institutions, the common budget that would enable it to compensate for the, the diversity of the various economies inside of Europe. He doesn't address any of these, uh, these problems. And this, the, these are the main problems that we're facing. Then. You know, we, the fact that the Eurozone has never achieved either prosperity or uh, political integration. He says nothing about these things. He just has empty promises about the idea of Europe. Laura, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. And thank you for joining us here on The Real News Network.